Hello boys and girls, it's Uncle Night Shift and tonight we're gonna build an M4A3 Sherman, the famous EZ8, but no, it's not gonna be Fury. It's gonna be a basic out of the box project, but I'll try to make it a bit special. And I'm sure the thumbnail already gave you a hint that it's gonna be a little chunkier than it should be, so let's crack open the box and let's dive into all that sweet Tamiya goodness. <laughs> My friends, it's about time we built something that originated in the good old US of A. I actually purchased this kit while I was building that dreadful T90 from Revel, because I was getting so frustrated that I needed to ease my nerves with some sweet good Tamiya. Anyway, looking into the box we're getting exactly what one would expect from a new Tamiya kit in 148 scale, although I was a bit taken aback that they dropped those die cast lower hulls and instead are giving us these metal weights. It's an interesting decision, I mean, it's kinda pointless in my opinion, but why not? We're also getting these link and length tracks, which is awesome, and we'll take a look at how to assemble them. And the kit also comes with a pretty nice cast texture, but as usual, it can be improved. There's also the ever-present simplification of some details, which is another trait of Tamiya kits, but will improve at least some of them. I mean, it should be pretty easy. The decals are pretty basic, just a bunch of stars, and the typical string. Ah. I'd like to see Tamiya replacing this with a simple length of twisted wire like other brands. And the only extra thing I bought was a metal barrel from RB model because it was very cheap and I was able to order it alongside the model. So anyway, let's get started. I was thinking what to say about my initial build impressions and, well, it's pure heaven compared to the Revel T90 from a few weeks ago, but I guess that's no surprise. <laughs> Everything fits without a single hitch. Uh, I, mean, I mean, each part is engineered so precisely that you might get the feeling that just a simple cleanup of the parts might ruin their excellent fit. When I'm sometimes talking about that Lego feeling, you know, where everything snaps together, then this is it. This is the definition of Lego fit. Sometimes you can even hear that satisfying click when dry fitting the parts together. It's... seriously, it's a day and night. However, when it comes to road wheels, Tamiya or no Tamiya, there's always a lot of cleanup. Mainly because of those ever-present mold lines, which are a thing on every injection model kit because it's the result of how the kit is manufactured. Their size depends on the overall quality of the kit, sometimes they're large, sometimes they're barely noticeable, but they're always there. And not just on the wheels, they are on every part of every kit ever made, so if there's one advice I can give, just take the extra time and make sure to clean them up, because they can lower the overall impression of a finished model a lot. On the other hand, I can't not mention the fact that seam lines are often present on real road wheels, again as a result of manufacturing, but what we're getting in our kits is unfortunately not in scale if you'd like to recreate that. Anyway, despite the more complicated running gear on this tank, there was again no fitting issues and each wheel has such a nice fit that it pretty much aligns itself when you're gluing it in place. Tamiya even mentions that you have to pay attention and make sure every wheel touches the ground, and I pretty much achieved that with, without too much effort. So then I left the running gear for a few hours to set and I assembled the upper hull, which again went together like Lego, and also the turret. Here I got, here I got a bit carried away and pretty much built the entire thing in one session, and I made it into a video about creating cast steel texture, which you might have seen last week. And if you didn't, link is down in the description. Let's now assemble the tracks. First we need to fill these ejector pin marks, which again shouldn't be there, and they're again the result of the manufacturing process. And some care is needed while filling them, because we don't want to smear anybody between the links. Give it about 20 minutes to dry and we can safely sand off the excess. Mind you, I didn't spend time filling the upper track run, because it's gonna be out of sight. That's one of the advantages of this type of tracks. And then after some quick cleanup, I scraped off the seam lines on each side. Again, another example of seam lines that need to be removed if we want our models to look more authentic. Now we just need to follow the instructions. The manual tells us exactly how many links to use on each side. I mean, around each wheel. 
and also what's the correct orientation of the track. However, it doesn't tell us how to assemble it with ease. So this is the trick. You just have to assemble the track laying flat on your workbench, using the exact amount of links as stated in the instructions, and just add a small amount of thin modeling cement between each link. It's better to use thin glue because it will nicely flow between each part. This way you'll assemble the entire track and once you're done, just give it a few minutes, somewhere between 2 and 5 should be enough, because we just need to give the glue a bit of time to create a good bond so the track doesn't fall apart. Yet the track needs to remain flexible. And then we just simply wrap the track around the running gear. Again, it's important to note the orientation of the track, because these link and length tracks are molded very precisely. They are often molded with sack, or the amount of links might not be symmetrical, so if you accidentally put the track on in the wrong direction, it might not fit. Another important thing is to leave the drive sprocket movable, so it can fit into the track, and not the other way around. And the coolest thing about this trick is that the track will remain removable for easier painting because I didn't glue it to the wheels. I'll just secure it temporarily with the tape so that this gap won't be too big. Give it at least a few hours and the track will keep its shape even when you remove it. Once the model is painted and weathered, I'll just slip the track back on the tank and fix the single disconnected spot with super glue. So what do you think? Pretty cool stuff, huh? Next on the menu was the upper hull. Before I could add the field applied armor, I needed to make a few improvements, such as the weld beads, which are actually very nice, just the way they are, and I didn't even need to replace them with new ones made from epoxy putty. Instead I just textured them with a hobby knife and then melted the texture with liquid cement. Other welds are not as good looking, so I decided to slice them off for the time being, and I'll replace them with the new ones later. And finally I added the cast armor texture on this front plate the same way I did on the turret, so first I stippled the part with glue, which created the rough surface, and then I gave it another round with Tamiya putty diluted with the same liquid cement. Ok, so let's now get to the meat and potatoes of this model, the concrete armor. I'm not building any specific tank, but my inspiration comes from this one, which is an easy 8 but has the earlier type of turret and different gun barrel. I decided to create most of the volume from scrap styrene. I found this sheet in my garage a long time ago and you might recognize it. I for example made my small cutting board and putty rolling sheets from it, and I've cut it into smaller strips with the aid of Tami a scribing tool, because I find it faster to make rough cuts this way. Then I traced the approximate shape of the hull onto it, and after cutting three identical pieces for each side, I glued them together and then glued them to the hull. The front plate has the more complicated shape, and I also needed to remove a bunch of things to make the process easier. I also scratch built those small fender braces from Styrene, because they were missing in the kit, and I also added the obligatory wooden beam which is often seen on Sherman tanks. In this case, I'll have to build up the volume from several smaller pieces of plastic, and for this purpose I dug out my cutting tool called the Choppa. I bought it a long time ago on eBay, and <laughs> it cost me around 40 bucks, and I paid the same amount for shipping. I know, what was I thinking? Well, it definitely saved me a lot of time on this project, because I was able to make lots of identical strips in a matter of seconds, which I then glued individually to the front plate. The cool thing about the chopper is that we can cut and use even the smallest offcuts, so no plastic will go to waste. And finally we can cover this modern art piece with epoxy body. I didn't want to waste my favorite Tami epoxy for this, but unfortunately my stocks of magic sculpt are running low. That's the reason why I made most of the shape from plastic, but still I ended up using quite a lot of it, because it dries quite fast, so I was never able to use the entirety of it and the rest, which was getting too hard to work with, had to go into the trash bin. But anyway, I started by filling every large hole, which I wasn't able to close with styrene, and I also used this step to create the basic form of the concrete, for example all these rounded sections at the front. The fast drying type of this body had one advantage though. By the time I was done with this step, it was already hard enough that I could start adding another layer. Even though the one reference photo shows the travel lock was left to move freely, there are other instances where it was buried under the concrete. 
or sandbags, or in some situations a mixture of both. And like I said, by the time I was done filling the large holes, the putty was already hard enough to get it covered with another layer, so I mixed another batch of putty and this time I spread it in a rather even layer over the entire surface. This layer will determine the final shape of the concrete armor, so I was trying to be pretty neat. Of course this modification was done in the field and I'm sure it was done by the crew, not even by field mechanics, so it definitely wasn't perfect, but at the same time I think it's important to... Well, the most obvious thing is to follow reference pictures, again quick check, but also keep in mind that while it was done in the field, with hand tools and definitely in a rush, it wasn't done by Neanderthals, <laughs> okay, so I think it shouldn't be all over the place and too messy. That's also why I used this old dentist tool, it works like a small scale trowel. But the overall texture was quite smooth and I didn't have time to make any rough impressions in the putty because it again dried faster than I could get to it, so I mixed some Tamiya putty again, but this time I didn't use as much glue as I normally would and I stippled it over the entire surface. This time I was intentionally going for the roughest and most grainy surface I could make, but at the same time I tried to create some variety. For example, the sides were probably cast using wooden planks or pieces of scrap metal, and while I wasn't able to create that specific texture with visible lines where the planks were, I at least made the concrete texture a bit smoother here. And as soon as I was done I forgot to give you an overall shot of the result because I was in a rush to continue on the hull, <laughs> sorry. And well here I drilled out the missing drainage holes on the extra armor plates and because I'm dumb I drilled this one in the wrong position. <laughs> but it was easy to fill it with Tami epoxy putty, the same which I then used to create the missing weld beads. Let's now take a look at how to replace these molded on grab handles. I recently bought a set of modeling chisels and they are excellent for removing small amounts of plastic just like in this example. So I removed most of it, most of it, not all, because I used the remnant as a guide to drill out two holes for the new handle. I marked them with a needle, which then worked as an anchor point for the drill bit so it wouldn't stumble over the entire surface. And then I removed the remaining portion of the original part and cleaned any fuzz with a bit of Mr. Cement S. After measuring the original handles I bent new ones from 0.3mm copper wire and I used a pair of surgical forceps as a bending tool. It gets continuously wider and it has these small teeth inside which act as a guide, so it's excellent for precise bending. And obviously not only for precise work but also for making numerous handles which are gonna be exactly the same. Then I fixed it in place with two different CA glues. The flexi one from VMS because it's very strong and it cures pretty much instantly, and then the black one from MX Spawn which dries slowly, but it works great as a filler. Once they were dry I removed the excess with super glue debonder, which dissolves super glue but doesn't damage styrene. And to make sure that there were no visible gaps I gave it a quick round of diluted Tamiya modeling putty, which I then again cleaned up with debonder. There were also a few missing details which I could make with the punch and die tool from RP tools, mostly some axle details on hatch hinges and also a few bolts on the rear engine plate. But one thing that bothered me quite a lot was the missing strap detail on the engineering tools. Well, luckily enough Shermans didn't have any sophisticated clamps but just good old simple leather straps. And even though they'd look better if they were made as a photo edge detail, I think using pieces of Tamiya masking tape which I've cut to around 1mm white strips is gonna be good enough. By the way, sure, there are photo edge detail sets available for this model, but I wanted another out of the box build so I purposely chose this subject. As you can see the strap tie downs are again molded as solid blocks on the hull, but I didn't feel like replacing them would help too much. So instead of using a single length of tape, I've cut it into several smaller lengths and I basically built, so to say, the strap from them. I wasn't able to find a good historical photo showing them up close and the only photos I found were from restored tanks. 
and each one had a different type of strap. So I decided to take a simple way out and added a small circle punched from a tin foil to act as a button on top. <laughs> I know it's not 100% accurate, but I think it's good enough. The biggest benefit of a photo edge set on this model would be having in scale headlight and tail light covers. Luckily, the headlights are hidden under a layer of concrete and these tail light covers are very easy to make from strips of copper sheet or aluminum sheet or whatever. Because we can use the original kit part as a template and bend the replacement parts over it. It's one of those things that looks very hard, but once you commit, it's surprisingly easy. <laughs> but I guess it was too easy because at this point I spilled my beloved debonder. Well, if things seem to be too good to be true, ladies and gentlemen, they usually are. Anyway, at this point the tank was pretty much done, but what kind of Sherman it would be without some stowage, right? <laughs> well, it seems like it's time to face my stowage phobia. <laughs> so I bought the 148 scale jerry can set from Tamiya and I used a few jerry cans from it, alongside some 3D printed stowage, most of which I 3D modeled myself, such as those ammo crates, 30 cal ammo cans, and also the petrol canister. These were again printed on my Anycubic Photon, and another thing I'm gonna try is Paper Shaper from VMS. Well, that and also their dedicated paper to make tarps. This paper is about 50% thinner than regular office paper and it isn't fuzzy. You know, it doesn't have that fuzz most papers have. So after cutting it to size, I soaked it with paper shaper. <laughs> yeah, it rhymes. <laughs> and it's an interesting product because it acts as glue, but at the same time it softens the fibers to a point where the paper doesn't even act like, like paper. It becomes very flexible. That means we can crumple it any way we want, but it won't look like a huge pile of horribleness. The stowage was attached with super glue, and I used a few historical photos of Shermans as inspiration for this. And I also tied them to the model with Tamiya tape. Well, so to say, you know, tied them. And it was done the same way like I did with those straps on tools. Many tanks also had this field made bracket to hold the spare jerry can, so I bent it from a wire using the jerry can as a template. Pretty simple, but nice detail. But I gotta say that working with those paper tarps is very pleasant. It's simple and it's also efficient. Compared to the usual tarps made from rolled epoxy putty, it takes just a fraction of time and it's also way easier to create nice realistic folds. Not to mention the paper is very thin, so unrealistically thick tarps are not gonna be an issue. The flexibility of the soaked paper reminds me of one failed technique I was attempting in the past, when I was cutting pieces of latex gloves, but unfortunately these would shrink and crumple after some time, so they were pretty much useless and they also ruined the entire model. However, I'm a big skeptic when it comes to new products and techniques, so I think it's smarter to wait and see how they look once they're painted, which unfortunately will be a story for another video. The last step, which is recommended by VMS, is to brush some structural resin over the paper, which supposedly will make it smoother, and it dries to a clear, glossy, almost glass-like finish, so again, paint will tell how it will look. So anyway, that will have to do for tonight, my friends. The Sherman is built, loaded with stowage, up armored and ready to roll into the painting booth. <laughs> so if you want to see how it will look with some paints and some initial weathering, make sure to drop by the next Friday. And as always, I hope you found something useful in this video or at the very least found it entertaining to watch. And of course, I owe you a big thank you for watching all the way to the end. Also, I couldn't forget to mention my amazing patrons who make this weekly show possible. And if you'd like to get some extra exclusive content, you might want to consider joining them, because I'm posting there almost every day when I'm working on models, so the whole Patreon feed is almost like a behind the scenes blog, you know, documenting each project in real life. But there are other goodies as well, like one week early ad free videos, very big and very nice photos, like the ones you're seeing right now, 
and also a cool little function called direct messages, so we can get in touch. So if that's something you'd be interested in, then don't be shy to check it out, because it all starts at only $1 a month, all the way up to $10 a month. And each tier comes with a different package of rewards. Anyway, I think that's all I have for tonight, so thank you again my friends, I hope you have an amazing weekend, and as always, don't forget to give the video a like if you liked it, or a dislike if you didn't like it as much, and I'll see you mates in the next one. Cheers!